Yoga Path, Christian Gnostic Initiation, and the Esotericism of the Rosicrucians. A human being acquires the capacity for gaining knowledge of the higher worlds through initiation, which consists in an intimate path of development of the soul. There are various paths to this knowledge for various people, but the truth is everywhere the same. Only after we have achieved the pinnacle of a mountain do we have an unlimited view in all directions. But it would be nonsensical for us, starting from our present location, to take any but the most direct path to the top. It is the same with initiation. When we have arrived at the goal and have truly achieved the unhindered perspective of knowledge, then this knowledge is the same for everyone. It is, however, not good for us to follow any path of knowledge other than the one appropriate to our nature. Actually, there ought to be a special path of initiation for every individual man and woman. But all paths can be traced back to three different types, the yoga path, the Christian Gnostic initiation, and the Christian Rosicrucian initiation. We can travel on any of these three different paths. They are different because there are three diverse kinds of people. Among Europeans we find very few who can follow the yoga path. For this reason it is generally not right for a European to journey the yoga path. In the East people live in an entirely different climate, exposed to an entirely different form of sunlight. The difference between a person of the East and a European cannot easily be proved by anatomy, but there is a deep soul and spiritual difference between them. This difference must be taken into consideration because inner development reaches deep into the soul's spiritual nature of the human being. The finer structures of the brain of a Hindu are not perceptible to an anatomist. But if we were to demand of a European the same thing that can be expected of an Indian, then we would destroy him or her. We can prescribe certain actions for an Indian that would be of no use to a European or even or could even be detrimental for him or her. <clears throat> Above all, the yoga path places a certain fundamental requirement on the pupils, without the fulfillment of which it is not even possible to follow the path. It requires the strict authority of a teacher, a so-called guru. Those wanting to follow this path must accommodate themselves to the guru's instructions, even into the smallest details of their personal lives. Aside from this, the Indian yoga path can hardly be followed without removing oneself completely from the external conditions of life. It is necessary that the most varied external measures be taken in order to support the prescribed exercises. If one has experiences that make an impression on one's world of feeling, then this will have a deep influence if one is undergoing an inner esoteric development. For this reason, an Eastern student of yoga must ask the guru about all details of life. If one wishes to change anything in one's life, one must let the guru give direction. Hence the yoga path presupposes absolute submission to the guru. One must learn to see with the eyes of the guru and learn to feel as one's guru feels. One cannot follow this path without deep trust, without perfect love united with unlimited trust and an unreserved devotion that exceeds everything. There is only one great teacher in the Christian Gnostic path, the central guru. Faith in Jesus Christ himself is required, not only in his teachings. The Christian Gnostic pupil must be able to believe that in Jesus Christ a unique, elevated, divine individuality was incarnated who cannot be compared to any other. All other individualities on earth started on a lower step and then ascended. Buddha, Hermes, Zoroaster, Pythagoras. So that their spiritual stature was the result of many previous incarnations. With Jesus Christ this is not the case. He cannot be compared to any other individuality with anything else on the earth. Without this faith, it is impossible to follow the purely Christian Gnostic path. A third path is the Christian Rosicrucian. Here the teacher is the advisor who gives guidance limited primarily to the measures required for spiritual development. 
the spiritual development must be arranged in such a way that its influence completely permeates the life of the individual. A teacher must always be present at an initiation. There is no serious initiation without a teacher. Anyone who would maintain that would be saying something as foolish as someone who might say that the birth of a child is possible without the cooperation of both sexes. <clears throat> initiation is a process of spiritual fertilization. If this is not brought about by the dual relationship between teacher and pupil, then it would be a damaging process. The Indian yoga path distinguishes seven stages, but they do not always follow one another in the same sequence. The steps can be combined in various ways. It is not necessary to pass through the steps from one to seven in sequence. It can happen that someone is called upon to tackle one of the later seven stages ahead of time and is then given exercises corresponding to an entirely different stage. Perhaps the pupil will work through the exercises in several years, perhaps in several months. In response to the question of how long it takes to achieve initiation, Subha Rao, spelled S-U-B-B-A-R-A-O, Subha Rao, indicated that it can take seventy incarnations or seven incarnations. For some it takes seven years and for others seven months, seven days or perhaps just seven hours. It depends entirely on the spiritual maturity a human being has already achieved. Spiritual maturity manifests faster with some and more slowly with others. It depends on karma. We may ask why a certain human being does not become prominent even though that individual may have existed at a very high level in a previous incarnation, excuse me, in a previous existence. Perhaps there are hindrances in one's bodily and soul constitution. The task of the teacher consists primarily in clearing away these hindrances. An individual's external physiognomy in ordinary life is not decisive in this sense. An earlier initiation may be resting deeply hidden in the soul, and not appear simply because of certain hindrances. The first stage of the Indian yoga training is called Yama Tat, which implies a foregoing or not doing. For the Indian this meant not killing, not lying, not stealing, not leading a licentious life, not desiring. But if we want to penetrate deeper into what the Indian meant by this term, we must take it in context. Even if we become vegetarians, we have still not given up killing. Our life is not even possible without killing. Simply by breathing we are killing, because we breathe out carbon dioxide. If the green carpet over the earth did not continually take up carbon dioxide and give back oxygen, neither animals nor human beings could live. Part of the yoga path consists precisely in giving up this killing. Indians take this point very seriously. They would consider many of the relationships in our modern social life to be actually a form of stealing. In some form, every one of us must take in money. In order to acquire this money, many requirements must be met. When we buy a coat, we cannot know whether human blood stands behind it. We do not give much thought to our place in society and to our co-responsibility for what we do. If we are to live seriously, we must feel responsible for what happens because of us. We help our fellow human beings most by having few wants. Those who live frugally help their fellow human beings more than a philanthropist. For example, if one writes no unnecessary letters that might save some people from having to climb many steps. It is an error to think that we help people by having many needs and in this way creating more work. We do not in the least increase what people need when we give them work. Amid the complicated economic relationships that rule in Europe, it will become increasingly difficult to practice the conditions required by the Asian in order to travel the path of yoga. One can follow the yoga path in its strict form in a country where there are no banks, where the social relationships of a culture are transparent to all observers. The second stage is nayana, N-Y-A-N-A, the cultivation of ritual. Ritual is an important aid on the Indian yoga path for a pupil, thus being able to unite the teaching with a cultus. 
everyone taking the yoga path is strictly required to follow a ritual. The spiritual content must be made visible in actions that take place in front of the pupil. Just as art requires the actual shaping of external objects, so too with this form of initiation it is essential that spiritual content be portrayed in ritual. The third stage is asana, which involves completely conforming the body's posture to certain cosmic streams. When a feeling for such things was still alive, cultic structures were built, for example, with the main altar always facing east. Because of the sensitive physical organization of Indians, the direction of their physical stance in space is significant. There is, as a matter of fact, a different stream flowing from north to south than from east to west. In the yoga initiation, the position of the body is significant because the Indian's body is much softer and any particular position will exert a greater influence on such a person. If a European wanted to follow the eastern path of yoga, such a person would have to follow through with all these measures. The fourth stage is pranayama, rhythmic breathing. This is easiest for us to understand when we consider the fact that contemporary human beings kill with breathing. The teacher instructs the pupil, quote, you should regulate your breathing at least for a certain time according to the rules given by your teacher, unquote. If we were to investigate breath, we would find that the air exhaled by a yoga pupil has an entirely different composition, an entirely different carbon dioxide content than, what fo than that found in ordinary people. Consequently, <clears throat> it is true that yoga pupils influence the future development of the earth through regulating their breathing process. Steady drops hollow out a stone. Results cannot be achieved overnight, but it is cumulative, and over longer periods of time it will have a significant specific effect. A Rosicrucian teacher will also have pupils work on the process of rhythmic breathing at certain times. What does the breathing process accomplish? The physical human body is not conceivable without plants. We inhale oxygen. It is united with carbon in the lungs and we exhale carbon dioxide. The plant does exactly the opposite. There is a constant circulation between human beings and plants. In the distant future the human being will create an organ within himself that will accomplish what the plants do today. Human beings will be in a position to transform carbon dioxide within themselves. This will be made possible by an organ with which human beings will separate carbon from oxygen and then unite it with themselves. What we take in with our nourishment for the building up of our body today, we will then consciously activate within ourselves. In that way, we will transform carbon dioxide again into oxygen. This process is actually aided by rhythmic breathing. This teaching was given in detail in Rosicrucian schools of the 14th century. The betrayal of several such secrets has brought some of this teaching into popular literature. There is something about the philosopher's stone mentioned in a writing from the 18th century. However, the author himself probably had no understanding at all concerning the true nature of the subject. The whole human being must be transformed in order to accomplish what the plant now does for the individual. The physical body will then be carbon itself, but it will not be black carbon, neither will it be hard diamond, which serves only as a symbol for the philosopher's stone. By the term, quote, philosopher's stone, unquote, is understood a body that is transparent and contains the other organs as members. It will consist of a mass of gelatin-like carbon similar to protein. Humankind is on a track on which it will one day develop itself to this wonderful glory. The rhythmic breathing that leads to this end is called alchemy, and the philosopher's stone is termed lapis philosoph philosophorum. The man who wrote about it did not himself know what he was writing. The fifth stage of the yoga path is pratyahara. It consists in the ability to suppress the impressions of the external senses. We must make clear to ourselves what our soul world actually is and exclude everything that has penetrated into us from outside. Most of what constitutes our consciousness when we are thinking has entered us from outside. 
when we are able to devote ourselves consciously to inner thought, when we can make ourselves blind and deaf to our surroundings and yet remain inwardly awake, when we can have a thought without it being a reflection of something external, then our sleep will be filled with dreams and we are practicing pratyahara. At the sixth stage, not only must we fully absorb what our eyes can see and our ears can hear, we must also suppress the inner images and ideas that rise up from the soul itself. After we have removed from the soul everything that comes into it from through life, then we can place one image or idea in the soul. The guru gives it to us. It could be a thought such as is contained in the first four teachings of Light on the Path. That's a title, Light on the Path. The best contents for the soul are those that can be given by a special teacher. After such a content has worked in the soul for a time, it is allowed to sink into the depths without our becoming unconscious. We have then the function of the mental life without thought content. When we have reached this seventh stage, the spiritual world penetrates into us. This condition is called samadhi. The Christian Gnostic training also has seven steps. This method takes into account a somewhat coarser body and is particularly aimed at the realm of feelings and sensations. The seven stages of Christian initiation are the washing of the feet, the scourging, the crowning with thorns, the crucifixion, the mystical death on the cross, the burial, and the ascension. It is best for us to characterize these seven steps in such a way that we describe how the relationship between teacher and pupil unfolds. The teacher says something like the following to the pupil, quote, Behold the plant. It is rooted and grows in the mineral kingdom. If it were to speak to the mineral kingdom, it would have to say, My existence is due to you. I can live only because of you. I thank you. An animal would have to speak to the plant kingdom in a similar way. My existence is due to you. I can, I can live only because of you. End quote. And when human beings consider the nature that surrounds them and the human beings that stand be- beneath them, a similar feeling should pass through the soul. A higher stage can never be developed and reached without the presence of lower stages. For this reason, those people who are in a higher social position must also descend to those standing lower and thank them. Jesus Christ indicated this in the washing of the feet when he bent down to the disciples and washed their feet. On the first step of Christian initiation, the pupils must permeate themselves with this feeling of gratitude toward all those who stand below them. What they achieve thereby will be evident in two signs. First of all, they will see themselves in an astral vision in the situation of the washing of the feet. This takes place among all those who develop the proper feelings. Second, they will have a feeling as if water were rinsing over their feet. At the second stage, the pupils must learn to bear all the pain of life that is constantly unfolding around them. They must stand upright even when they have to endure the greatest pain. The symptoms of this condition are as follows. They see themselves scourged in astral vision and feel that something like needles pricking their skin at various places on their bodies. The third stage consists in achieving the ability to endure when what we consider to be most holy is heaped with mockery and derision. The teacher says to the pupil, quote, When you can bear the mockery of what is most holy to you and for all that still stand up for it, then you are capable of wearing the crown of thorns, unquote. The pupil will feel a special kind of headache upon reaching this stage. At the fourth stage, pupils must learn to see the body as something entirely external, to carry the body around in the same way we carry an instrument, a hammer or some other tool. In some schools, the pupils learn to speak of their bodies in such a way that they say, quote, my body goes through the door, unquote, and so on. At this stage, the pupils see themselves in astral vision nailed to the cross. They display the wounds of Christ on their hands and feet and on the right sides of their bodies. During moments of meditation and concentration, these red stigmata appear. <clears throat> the fifth step is mystical death. At this stage, the student has an experience 
as if a veil existed between him or her and the rest of the world, like a black curtain. They then experience inwardly all that is potentially evil in the world. The descent into hell is mystical death. The vision of this curtain being torn asunder points to this descent. At the sixth stage the feeling arises that everything in the world is one's own body. One is then united with the earth. This is the burial. The seventh step, the resurrection, cannot be described with words. Those who experience such feelings achieve an insight into the spiritual world. The third kind of initiation is Rosicrucian, which appeared in Europe during the fourteenth century. It relies upon a strengthening and empowering of the inner will. If Eastern training emphasizes thinking and the Christian Gnostic feeling, then the Rosicrucian teaching is directed toward developing and training the will. The steps of this training are study, imagination, learning the esoteric script, giving rhythm to one's life, understanding the correspondence between microcosm and macrocosm, contemplation or immersion in the macrocosm, and divine blessedness. Study requires the pupil to have the patience to acquire certain concepts concerning the world. First, pupils must learn from their teachers. For example, they must study with devotion what elementary theosophy can provide as a teaching. They must attempt to grasp these teachings as well as they can. Anyone wishing to penetrate to higher realms must patiently acquire concepts. A certain training of one's thinking is necessary. Living and weaving in the pure element of thinking must become a habit. Books such as title Intuitive Thinking as a Spiritual Path and title Truth and Science were written for those who want to achieve Rosicrucian initiation and train the spirit. Training depends on overcoming the difficulties that are endless for some people and involves following thoughts and recognizing how one thought evolves from necessity out of another. In Eastern training, strict submission to a guru is necessary. In Christian Gnostic training, pupils must place Jesus Christ at the center of their efforts. In Christian Rosicrucian training, the teacher stands at the side of the pupil as friend and advisor. It is much easier to stumble in the higher regions. For this reason we must have inner strength and certainty. In ordinary life, life itself will correct us. Sometimes life corrects our errors in a terrible way. We lose this correction when we enter higher worlds. For this reason the pupil must see and feel through the eyes of the guru in Eastern training. The pupil has an advisor in the European teacher. In any case, we need a different guiding principle when ascending into higher worlds. There are entirely different perceptions in the astral world than in the physical world. So, too, a new world of perceptions opens for us in the Devakonic realm. The three worlds are very different in terms of impressions, but one thing is the same in all three. This can be a sure guide for us on the astral and Devakon planes. If we can learn if we have learned to think with consistency through our study, we can help ourselves on the astral and devakonic planes. However, the logic of the physical plane no longer applies to the buddhi plane. The second stage of Rosicrucian training is imagination. This stage should not be striven for too quickly by European pupils because they can easily stumble. The human being must learn to enter into a moral relationship with, be with things. In all transitory things we must see a parable for or an image of something eternal. If we look at nature in this way, then for example the fall blooming crocus becomes for us a visible image of a lonely being that strives upward in melancholy. The violet becomes a symbol for something that fulfills its existence in modest, calm beauty. Every stone stimulates thoughts in us and is a metaphor for what stands behind it. In this way the world around us becomes richer. Things reveal their inner being to us. One flower becomes a tear through which the earth expresses its sorrow. Another becomes an expression of joy. Looking at a kernel of rice, we can see how a little flame grows out of it. The little flame becomes a picture for the leaf blade that grows from it later. 
The third stage sees an entire spiritual world coming forth from all beings. Their spiritual being, their spiritual content, hovers over things. The entire astral world becomes visible. We find ourselves as if in the middle of an ocean and experience ourselves as if swimming in that ocean. We see the color of a tulip as if lifted out of the plant and recognize that this garment con constitutes an astral being. Learning the esoteric script follows this third stage for the pupil. If we really want to live in the astral world, we must know the esoteric script. There are many things in the world constructed according to the shape of a vortex. This spiral we find in the Orion Nebula as well as in the form of living beings. Human and animal embryos have a spiral form in the early stages of their development. One part is a picture of the physical. The other part, which spirals around and into the first, is the astral. The start of a new stage in human history is also symbolized by the sign of two spirals joined together. This is the zodiacal sign of Cancer. When the ancient Indian subrace originated after the submergence of ancient Atlantis, the sun, S-U-N, rose on the first day of spring in the zodiacal sign of Cancer. When we learn to read the esoteric script, we learn to orient ourselves in the astral world. The fourth stage, learning the rhythms of life, follows. Pupils are instructed to regulate their breathing in a certain way. Everything in nature has rhythms. Every plant blossoms regularly at the same time. <clears throat> when we can follow the rhythms in the animal kingdom, for example, animals, we can also follow the rhythms in the animal kingdom. For example, animals are fertile only at certain times of the year. With human beings, however, rhythm falls into chaos. Many people have nothing but a forced rhythm. In general, people do not have voluntary rhythms. A Rosicrucian must care for rhythm in life. The special instructions of the teacher allow pupils to bring rhythm into the breathing process. The fifth stage is learning the correspondences between the microcosm and the macrocosm. There is a certain link between human beings and all the things of the world around them. For ordinary people, this manifests only in sexual love, in the feeling that occurs when a person finds in another what is known and familiar. But a great deal is based on this mysterious relationship between the world and the human being. For example, this relationship is the basis for what Paracelsus discovered about the relationship between certain plants and the human being. In a similar way, he also learned through the capacity to discern the correspondences between microcosm and macrocosm, the relationship of other substances to the human being. He called a person sick with cholera and, quote, arsenicus, unquote, because arsenic causes exactly the same symptoms in a healthy person as those that appeared in someone sick with cholera. It is possible to have a personal relationship, a, pers a relationship of love to all things that is entirely spiritual. It is possible to learn this by following certain instructions, but it must be practiced. For example, if we think using a certain word on the spot between the eyebrows, above the root of the nose, we can reach the point after a time when knowledge of a specific process in the world is revealed to us. By thinking of the inner eye, E-Y-E, we acquire knowledge of the nature of the sun, of the processes that were taking place when the sun and the earth still formed one heavenly body. Through another exercise we come to know what the moon is spiritually, or in what condition the earth was 18 million years ago. Next follows immersion in the correspondences between the microcosm and the macrocosm. By concentrating on the point between the eyebrows and over the root of the nose, we can penetrate to the time when the eye, capital, was drawn into the human being. Then human beings grew with their consciousness into the macrocosm. They must practice this meditation for a certain time and in this way grow into all things, whether they, can, whether they be near or far. The seventh step is that of divine blessedness, when we grow beyond the limited bodily husk and are able to live with the macrocosm. Such teachings are given to a pupil according to the spiritual esoteric state of the student's being. Once these steps have been worked through and truly experienced, the student will have achieved the pinnacle of knowledge of higher worlds.